This is the tomb of Michelangelo Buonarroti, one of the greatest geniuses and most interesting characters in history. You can see that there are three statues of female figures on it, and they represent the three crafts in which he was a master, sculpture, painting and architecture. And he's regarded as such a master in these areas because if you see what other Renaissance artists were making at the time, you can see Michelangelo's work as something different, something innovative, something loaded with much more meaning than these other works. So let's compare the work of Michelangelo in these three areas with the work that other Renaissance artists were producing and understand why he's such a game changer. In the early Renaissance we have these portraits by Italian artist Piero della Francesca. And I'd say these are normal because they are really driven by convention. Even the convention of representing someone in profile is something that comes down from Roman coins. We have a very decorous presentation of the figure and an attempt to represent space, so much so that the figure almost becomes a plain and established in foreground. When we get to somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, we see a different ambition going on. When we see the Mona Lisa, there's a posture that we recognize from classical sculpture going on here, and that is contraposto. That's where a human figure stands with most of its weight on one foot, so that the shoulders are going one direction, the head is going in another direction. There's this torsion in the body that begins to activate the space. So in Mona Lisa, Leonardo gives her a contraposto, and you can see that it's something he was very interested in, because when he paints Lady with an ermine, it almost becomes the theme of his painting. Look at how the ermine twists. There's something about these snake-like rodents that twists its body and assumes the kind of contraposto stance. And the girl is more or less imitating the stance of her little pet. So shoulders radically in one direction, head radically in another direction, hips in another direction. And you would think nothing could be more complex in terms of how a figure is positioned in space than Lady with an Ermine by Leonardo. And then you come to Michelangelo. This is called Doni Tondo. Doni, that's the name of the family that paid for this, they're the patrons, and Tondo is just the name of a round painting in Italian. And the subject of the Doni Tondo is much more complex. You can see the Virgin, the Child, and Joseph. But what exactly are they doing? You recognize in the posture of the Virgin, something akin to the Lady with the Ermine, but much more exaggerated legs pointing in one direction, arms pointing in another direction, and she's not simply posing to activate space, but this is how she holds her baby. So in part, Michelangelo was inspired by the tondo, the idea of this round frame, and to create a composition that doesn't do what these Renaissance compositions do. Nail the center, subdivide it, or make a triangle, but rather somehow activate spatially the idea of a circle with this overturning and upheaval. This composition certainly wouldn't work if the frame was a rectangle. Now you have to ask other questions about this. Why are there so many nude figures near the Holy Family? Usually in Christian iconology, the Holy Family stays away from naked people. And why are they so tiny? And who is this creepy guy behind the Holy Family? Jesus historically overlaps the time of pagan antiquity. And so we're looking at something that seems to represent the culture of the pre-Christian Roman civilization of all these heroic classical nudes. And so this act of overturning, this act of heaving up Jesus, elevating Jesus, is a kind of representation of overturning the old order and instituting a new order. And if you think about medieval sculpture like the carving of church portals, you have a large Christ and small last judgment people. And it almost looks like that kind of representation of different scales is going on here too. This might be Bacchus or Cupid with an arrow over his shoulder, representing love in a pagan sense, it might be John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus, who would have been that age when Jesus was this age, and who is typically represented by wearing wild animal skins to represent the time that he spent in the wilderness. So it's an ambiguous figure, and it kind of locks into the round composition. But it's a bizarre painting because of the things that it puts together. And that's mannerism, this moment of transition between high renaissance and baroque. Mannerism is making dense the iconological program, so that you could barely figure out what's going on, so that one meaning begins to support and simultaneously cancel out another meaning. And Michelangelo is regarded as a pioneer of Mannerist art and architecture. 
David, from the biblical story David and Goliath, was the emblematic figure of Florence. Florence self-identified with David. This is the David by Donatello, and this is by Andrea del Verrocchio. These were made decades before Michelangelo's David, and Donatello gets it right. He gets the contrapposto, he gets the classical nude, and there's a balanced repose to this. This is also a classical moment to represent. It is the moment after the completion of the action. David has triumphed over Goliath. The full cycle of anticipation and the completion of the event have been realized. You can see him with his sword and with his foot on the head of Goliath. Here we have Michelangelo's David. He's got his sling over his shoulder, there's a classical contrapposto, but he's about to act. He's contemplating the act. So there's a tension of incompleteness going on. This idea of moving away from repose and balance toward tension and anxiety. His muscles are flexed, his nostrils are flared. The veins are popping out of his hand as the blood is pulsing in anticipation of the act that he's about to complete. And even in this figure, there are all these distortions going on, like a giant head and giant hands. And the reason for these distortions is that Michelangelo was influenced by Neoplatonic thought, according to which, the most important activities of a human being are the thought and the action. And in order to highlight those two elements, Michelangelo made the head representing the thought and the hands representing the action in a bigger proportion than the rest of the body. And according to Neoplatonic thought, the human body is beautiful and reflective of divine order. And to gaze on the human body, you're gazing on something perfect. That's also the reason for the naked people in the Donitondo. And so we have a David that resembles more a classical Greek hero like Hercules, rather than the kid you read about in the biblical story of David and Goliath. Another famous Michelangelo, really early in his career, is the Vatican Pietà. Pietà means the lamentation of the Virgin over the dead Christ. And it's a beautiful work of sculpture, even from a technical point of view. Polished marble, an incredibly refined sense of gravity pulling the drapery down, and an amazing psychological complexity in the engagement between the Virgin and the dead Christ. But something is really odd about this sculpture also. The size of the Christ's body is really off compared to the Virgin. You know, if you had a woman take a large 33-year-old man and lie him down in her lap, you'd probably find something more like this. This is Perugino's Pietà. It's a painting. We have basically three people supporting the length of the Christ. So why does Michelangelo make the proportion of the Christ much smaller compared to the Virgin? And the answer is, he was again trying to collapse multiple meanings on the subject. But what could the multiple meanings be? And if you go back to something that we've seen before, like enthroned Madonna and child, this is a common representation of the Virgin and the Christ. The child on the lap, the Virgin seated, a triangular composition. We get it in Giotto, we get it in Botticelli, we get it in Raphael. We don't quite get it in Michelangelo because he's nuts, but we get it in the typical topos of how this is composed. And if you look at the Pietà, it is more the standard position of Virgin and child. So what is being represented here is not simply one moment in the life of Christ or the life of the Virgin, but it's this whole arc of birth and death. So where high Renaissance art emphasizes proportion, balance, and ideal beauty, mannerism exaggerates such qualities, often resulting in compositions that are asymmetrical or unnaturally elegant. Also, if you look at the face of the Virgin, you'll see that she looks really young, there is no way that this is the mother of an adult child. And part of that also has to do with the idea that she's being represented in two modes. She's being represented as the grieving mother of the dead child and the virgin mother of the baby. And that was Michelangelo. He was so clever. And the only way he can pull this stuff off is by distorting stuff like crazy. There's no way that keeping the sizes normal will allow him to have this kind of symbolic and emotive power. Michelangelo does not play by the rules, and he's a really interesting figure because of that. Because everything we've seen in the Renaissance before Michelangelo has been people trying to recover the rules from antiquity, the rules from ancient Rome, trying to figure out the formula and trying to apply the rules, and suddenly we have somebody like Michelangelo who realizes that by breaking the rules, you can actually make more meaning happen and get more emotional power out of it. 
By the way, this is the only work that Michelangelo ever signed. You can see that on the sash running across Mary's chest, it reads in Latin, Michael Angelus Bonarotus Florentinus Facievat, which translates to Michelangelo Bonarotti, the Florentine, was making this. The Pietà is a theme that Michelangelo came back to again and again in his work. This is a Pietà that he made late in his career. And it's kind of amazing, this is almost the opposite in terms of its expression about scale that we had in the Vatican Pietà, where the Christ is overwhelmingly large and overwhelmingly heavy. And these figures are desperately trying to hold him up, look at the scale of the figures. Also, in these classical paintings we would see things like a center line creating order. And here we have as our center line the heavy arm of the dead Christ pulling things down. And look at this guy. It's a self-portrait of Michelangelo. He includes himself in the representation as Joseph of Arimathea. So what Michelangelo is beginning to discover here in these later works of sculpture is that materiality matters. There is something about the Vatican Pietà that it's all about the mastery of the craft. It's all about making marble shine like alabaster or like skin. And as he moves forward, he realizes that there is something also incredibly powerful about the relationship of the figure to the block of stone that it came from. It's almost analogous to the creation of Adam and Eve from the mud of the earth. And so he begins to not simply play with engaged figures, but play with deliberate rustication of these figures. Like here, denaturing the face. And here is another Pietà, called the Rondanini Pietà. This is one that Michelangelo kept in his studio for decades and would constantly come back to and work at again. And the sensibility that he begins to reprise here seems almost gothic. That there's something about denying the weight of these figures and eroding the physical beauty of these figures that is more powerful or as powerful as the extreme beauty that he saw in things like the David and the Vatican Pietà. One might say that part of Michelangelo's tastes for a figure that's not fully liberated from the stone could have to do with the difficult history he had with Pope Julius II. Pope Julius II commissioned Michelangelo to do this colossal tomb with over 30 sculptural figures. Michelangelo quarried the stone and he was in the midst of working on the sculptures and the commission stopped. So he finished astonishing sculptures like Moses, but he was also left with a lot of figures like this Atlas who is trapped in the marble. And Atlas, the mythological figure, has as his burden holding up the earth. And so the idea that there is this perfect contrapposto classical torso caught in the earth, holding up the earth, had not quite liberated becoming the earth, is pretty powerful. A couple of things to say about the Moses though. It's probably the most realistically and masterly crafted statue made by Michelangelo. You can see the minute detail of the beard, the drapery, his muscles, even Michelangelo thought this was his most lifelike creation. The two horns on his head were the product of a mistranslation of the Bible. The mistranslation has been corrected, so if you look for it in a modern Bible, you will not be able to find it. But if you find a Bible in Latin, you will find it. So there it is, Exodus 34, verse 29. Cunque descenderet Moises de Monte Sinai, tenebat duas tabulas testimoni, et ignorabat cot cornuta eset facie sua ex consortio sermonis domini. So that means, when Moses descended from the Mount Sinai, he had the two tablets, and he ignored that his face was horned. So this word, cornuta, means horned. In the original Hebrew, this would have been rays of illumination or rays of light. But this is a version of the Bible that Michelangelo had access to. This is a version of the Bible that Michelangelo would have read. And so that explains the horns in the head of Moses. Probably the most famous work made by Michelangelo is the Sistine Chapel. In a total of nine scenes, Michelangelo related the book of Genesis. This was not the first time the subject had been depicted. Yet like Leonardo's Last Supper, it has become virtually the canonical representation. We visualize the first book of the Bible according to Michelangelo. In the first rectangular field, we have God separating light from darkness. God whirls overhead and we glimpse only the underside of his neck and beard. Next, we have him creating the plants and the sun and the moon. We are left with the most unusual glimpse of God's backside, and it's Michelangelo's mannerist imagination that places this extraordinary image before our eyes. God seen back and front, here and there, 
a visual equivalent of his omnipotence and omnipresence. And you can see that the face of God recalls the awe-inspiring features of Michelangelo's Moses. The next scene is of God separating the earth from the waters. A dramatic foreshortened God hovers over the placid seas. Next is one of the most famous moments in the Sistine Chapel, the creation of Adam, which is a central scene in the ceiling, as it is the most important part of creation. As you can see, the shape of the large mantle of God resembles a cross-section of a human brain that reminds us that God is infinite mind from whom all creation flows. And already by the creation of Adam, inside of that infinite mind of God, there's Eve. And you know, even here, there are things like these mannerist moments where the astonishing energy of God is in striking contrast to the incredible vicissitude of Adam, formed of the mud on which he reclines, and this gap between the fingers, about to take action, about to have something amazing happen. After this is the creation of Eve, who emerges from the side of Adam as he sleeps. Then we have the temptation and fall of Adam and Eve, who are represented twice, before and after the fall. We move left to right from the comparative verdancy and intimacy of the Paradise Garden to the barren, expansive plain of the couple's exile. Eve's youthful bloom and innocent body are transformed into an aged woman who has suffered the pain of childbirth. At the center of the garden, and appropriately central to Michelangelo's composition, is a tree of knowledge, and the serpent, winding around the tree, tempts Eve as Adam reaches for the forbidden fruit. Thus, rather than woman being responsible for tempting man, he is agent of his own fall for grace. Michelangelo takes no comfort in the version of the story which lays full blame on Eve. Instead, he offers us a more nuanced meditation on the nature of sin and temptation. As we have observed from Michelangelo, invention invigorates a traditional tale and loads it with meaning. The figures in the last three scenes are small and difficult to distinguish from the floor of the chapel. This is because these were painted before the rest of the scenes, and Michelangelo was still experimenting with this technique. But then he rectified the problem in the subsequent scenes by enlarging the figure and simplifying the compositions. In fact, all of the scenes I just talked about have a composition that looks more like a sculpture rather than a painting. We have the sacrifice of Noah, we have the deluge with over 60 figures populating the scene, as we viewers see the small space in which the survivors cling and sense their inevitable fate as a flood rapidly rises. And we finally have the drunkenness of Noah. After the deluge, Noah, dressed in red in the background, can be seen hard at work tilling the soil to grow vines. Later, in the foreground, Noah sleeps after having consumed too much wine and his sons find their father in this condition and mock him. In the surrounding panels of the ceiling, we have seven Old Testament prophets and five sibyls, female seers of pagan antiquity who were thought to have foretold the coming of a messiah. There are a few sketches that remain showing us how Michelangelo thought about these things. This is a Libyan sibyl. Michelangelo would sketch from life, but he would sketch men because that's the kind of model you could get. And then he would slap breasts on them, like in this sculpture from the Medici chapel he did in Florence. You have a male torso and then these cylinders added. A bit later, in the far wall of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo had an additional commission. And that was the Last Judgment. And the Last Judgment, in many ways, is the same image that you saw in Gothic cathedrals, where you have the judgment happening in the middle and these rows of people, the damned, the purgatory, the saved. And of interest is this figure, which is a self-portrait of Michelangelo as flayed skin. This is how some martyrs were killed, and so Michelangelo represents himself as a flayed carcass of Saint Bartholomew. And he presents himself again and again in these states of anguish and states of grief, because he had a tormented and complex life. He couldn't find enough hours in the day to do all the work he had to do. He had to support his entire family. Everybody was a freeloader, and he himself was incredibly frugal and his nephews lived like kings in Florence, or at least spent his money as fast as they could. This was the first of a series of two episodes about Michelangelo, where I talked about his sculpture and about his painting. In part two, I will talk about his greatest works of architecture, 
and I will leave a link in the description to that video. But in the meantime, I would really appreciate if you like this video because it helps me a lot and subscribe to my channel if you enjoy my content. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed and learned, and I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye.